to um, get us started actually was, um, so I'm, I'm reading this book now. Ooh. Uh, pseudoscience. Hey. Hey. James, James Kaufman and Alison Kaufman are two friends of mine. Yeah. So it's a fantastic yeah. book that they've put together here. And That's super cool. Yeah, it is. It's an amazing book. I've just been enjoying it so much. And there's an essay um, by Emilio Lobato and Corrine Zebermann. And um, what Emilio and Corrine, uh, I, hope, I hope that that's the right pronunciation of, or maybe it's Corinne, um, pronunciation of their names. Um, so they, they wrote an essay in here called The Psychology of Pseudoscience, Cognitive, Social, and Cultural Factors. And it's it's just a wonderful essay and I've made lots of notes in it. And but there was this one spot that it, it caused me to stop and reflect and smile and, and think about something. Um, so uh, let, me, let me share this with you. It says uh, Jean Piaget credited his meeting with Albert Einstein in 1928 for inspiring a long line of research on children's understanding of scientific concepts and their abilities to acquire, integrate, and refine their knowledge about the natural and social world. So I thought this inspiration that Jean Piaget had from Albert Einstein to actually understand how children see the world and that innate curiosity that, that children have and that, and that serving as the foundation for scientific understanding um, reminded me of the story of your mother having mm. uh, doing a, a term supporting uh, Piaget's research. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about um, your mom and start there. And oh, that's a lovely place to start. Thank you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and talk about um, scientific thinking and, and see, I want to see if there's a connection. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, well, my mom, um, as you were alluding to, was able to work with Piaget. This was in the 60s. <clears throat> so Piaget was at what was then called the Jean-Jacques Rousseau Institute, which is the University of Geneva. And, you know, he had a, obviously like a very pr productive group of students. And my mother, who was a young woman, she was in the United States at the time. She had gone from Argentina to the United States and had been she expressed this i'll never i don't know i wouldn't do this maybe you would kelly but she she expressed to one of her professors of psychology that she was really interested in the topic and her professor said you should look at this guy piaget who's in uh, switzerland and so my mom went to <laughs> went to switzerland why not, uh, why not? <laughs> um <laughs> which you know for a woman being raised in latin america in in the 60s um, was a big deal, but but apparently my grandfather was also very supportive of his daughters, which is a good thing. Um, so she went not knowing anything, studied uh, for a few years with Piaget, and did her dissertation data collection on children's acquisition of a second language. And what she did, which I will always admire, was it was cross-cultural research at a time when there wasn't that much of that going on. She went to uh, Machu Picchu and took a look at the indigenous children there, um, the native Peruvians, the, the Incas, who grow up speaking a language, Quechua, um, and then have to acquire Spanish when they go to school. And so she was just investigating at <clears throat> sort of Pi Piaget's theory, had some specific views about at what age it was uh, the best to acquire a second language. And so she was looking sort of developmentally. I don't remember what she found, um, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but yeah, um, she, she did that there. And, and the, the wonderful thing, I think, about having been raised by my mother specifically was that she never pushed any of that stuff on us. Um, she used to, <laughs> I remember the realization, you know, Piaget had this famous stage theory of, of uh, development where he thought you went through a number of stages of cognitive development and you acquired more and more complex uh, concepts that way. And uh, she used to tell us that we, when we said 
certain things that we were going through a stage. And it wasn't until college when I started reading about Piaget that I was like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, but she never really talked that much about him. It, he, he, she let me come to psychology on my own. I think that what she gave me, though, was even as somebody who was raised in a very religious environment as she was, um, she always had a certain amount of skepticism that uh, that I think was the direct antecedent, at least, of my my scientific curiosity. All right? She she was, but she just wasn't one of those parents who would give me books and push me to to learn about certain things. She just sort of let me unfold. And in fact, this was very Piagetian. This was. Um, one, one of the things that Piaget believed was that the process of development, of cognitive development, was a maturational process. It was like a tree would develop from a seed uh, into a full-blown tree. That, that meant to him that there were strong biological processes that were going to be universally true for all children. Uh, and not that the environment wasn't important, because much like a tree, right? The, the proper environment is important for development. Um, but he, he did not believe that um, it was either beneficial or effective to try to push kids to get to stages earlier in development. In fact, he, he called it the American question because every time he would get asked by Americans a question about his theories, it would be something along the lines of how do I get my kid into whatever formal operations earlier? And he was perplexed by this um, because he thought, you know, they're going to get there. <laughs> they're, they're just going to get there. And, and I think that sort of sit back and, and let, let your child find their own, you know, niche, their own, their own interests, let, let them develop. This is, this is easily said when you have an environment that allows for exploration of ideas, right? This, this is, this is uh, not something that that most kids in the world have, um, but we we're lucky to have that. So I I think that if she had pushed me, I would have not been interested. You know, there's there's some there's a contrarian aspect to trying you know to science maybe that that <laughs> that uh, that is maybe a personality characteristic that ironically might have pushed me away from it had she pushed it. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's wonderful to to hear mom, you know, reflected in your in your story and in your your journey. Um, it leads me to think about, uh, you know, maybe it's time to revisit the American question because yeah. if we look at where we're at right now, um, the reason why I I reached out for this this book was because uh, we're in an era where those stages of development around things like curiosity. Uh, and skepticism um, uh, have us in a place where a large percentage of our society is not exhibiting um, good cognitive uh, discipline around what it is that they uh, believe to be true or want to be true. And um, unfortunately, that's even in, our, in, in the positions of highest leadership politically. And so I think we're in in a place where the American question needs to be um, reframed because left to our own devices, our, our environment is, is not conducive to that healthy scientific inquiry. I'd um, love to get your response to that. Yeah, you know, um, I was in a conversation the other day where somebody uh, pointed out the importance of facts. And I thought to myself, <laughs> Why would you ever need to point out the importance of facts, right? This is, it, it seems on the face of it, right, that, that factual information is, is, is something we would all want. I think, that, yeah, there is a deep problem. Um, I think one of the deepest problems that psychologists could contribute to is this very question. What is going on with um, people who don't seem receptive to what we would think of as reasonable information that comes from the scientific community or from, you know, experts at large. And I, I think the easy thing to do, especially for people who, who believe themselves to be on the, on the side of uh, 
science and sort of championing um, uh, the causes that that people on that side of the political spectrum, um, the left would champion, that it's very easy to say, well, some people are stupid and I'm not. And I think that's exactly the wrong, the wrong way to approach the problem. Because what we're seeing is, I think, an amplification of blind spots. And I'll tell you what I mean about that in a second. But importantly, I think nobody is immune to this. This is, this is a problem we all face. Now, the, what, what kind of information or what kind of uh, things you, are, you end up being biased toward obviously can have a great impact, right? Because if I'm unreasonable about what food I eat, who cares? If I'm unreasonable about my views on climate change, that's a problem. But I think we're all deeply unreasonable. And uh, I think the problem is magnified by a set of conditions that we're seeing right now. And I think the biggest condition is that we have more than ever access to, let's put information in quotes. That is, we have access to a ton, a ton of material that you, you might think, well, we have access to more facts than ever, right? I can log on to, to Snopes.com and, and see whether or not something is true or not, right? I can, I can find authoritative sources on, uh, by just by Googling it. Why would people be less amenable to, to the truth? And I think it is simply because the more information that is out there, the more able we are to find information that is consistent with what we believe. And the, the big irony of this information age is, I think, that it has caused us to believe that we have firm ground to stand on when, in fact, all we're doing is uh, repeating information that's out there that is consistent with what we already believe. And that, I think, is a danger for everybody. Yes. The, one of the things that's very interesting, um, circling back to a comment that you made um, that I think is particularly um, useful for where we're at right now is when you said, you said, um, my mother was very religious yeah. and yet she was also skeptical. And I think that that is a very, um, a very powerful comment because some of where we see um, what you know these unwarranted beliefs in in things that you know present themselves as fact and get reinforced over and over again and so rightfully they get you know ascribed this value of looking like uh, truth um, this unwarranted belief isn't isn't being uh, challenged enough and yet it seemed that you know you you said that she was extremely religious and yet yeah. very skeptical and how important that is. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, you know, my grandfather was also very religious, her, his, her father, and was also a scientist. And one of the most formative moments uh, for me, I remember in talking to my grandfather was at the point where I started to question the religious beliefs, especially when they clashed with science. So, so my grandfather, you know, had very specific views about intelligent design, for instance. And I remember asking him at one point, what are we to do with this? I think it was the fossil record, you know, that's inconsistent with what people in our denomination believe. And he said, I don't know. <laughs> that's a hard one. And we may not, we just may not know that is, but he admitted that there was a deep inconsistency there. And for some reason, I remember thinking, well, it wasn't that bad to admit that we don't know something like this is something that maybe is obvious to many people, but to be confident enough to say that you are ignorant about some things is one of the best lessons I think we can teach our children to te you know, teach each other is, is to admit when you don't know, because, um, or else that arrogance will just amplify those things that, are, that we were talking about, uh, about earlier. Um, you know, the fanaticism of many religions, especially the religion that I was growing up in, um, was something that my mom hated. I, I always thought my, 
there was a direct line my mother and my grandpa to, to they maybe they were more skeptical than than they ever let on because of the particular culture in which they were raised but i think it's at least a great story about why it's not just that some people believe um in kooky religious ideas from our perspective right because i know they believe in kooky religious ideas from my perspective but that does not mean that they're not good citizens and open to to things that experts tell us right it's not an excuse just <laughs> so one of the things that's um very interesting to me is is there is this uh, inconsistency about um you know one of the um, findings when we study um, people who hold uh, conservative political beliefs and values is is the um, is the role that authority plays within the uh, you know conservative um, ideology and value system, and yet the role of authority and the role of expert has been very um, almost um, you know the, the the skepticism of of people who assert themselves as false experts has been um, has been weak. And the lack of acceptance of authorities for even just merely this is the expert, this is the authority in this case, and we should accept. It's, it's this, uh, you know, rejection of those things that's quite fascinating and inconsistent to me. Yeah. You know, there is something, when you look at people, say, who, who tend to believe in conspiracy theories, there is something that is often common to them. And that is a desire to know things that other people don't know. And there is a lure of having information and believing that people are trying to keep it from you, um, which is p just perfect for this particular climate where we have widely available scientific information that's open and free. And we have consensus amongst scientific experts again, paradoxically, this often leads to the exact kind of situation where somebody is going to be skeptical. And so, so here's why I think we all, we always ought to be careful because, you know, I actually have friends who believe in some really kooky conspiracy things and they think I'm a chump for buying everything the experts are telling me. Right. So, I mean, I think there's genuine reasons why they're wrong. Right? This is not to say that, that th these are equal positions, but I get the feeling, right? I understand the desire to know things that, um, that not everybody knows. Um, you feel special, you feel important. And you, you know, science is available to everybody. There's just, everybody agrees on a lot of stuff. Like it's not, it's not, it's not as intriguing as believing, you know, that they're implanting microchips in us, but they don't want us to know. <laughs> no. No, I think the other thing that is very humanizing um, a, about people who believe in conspiracy theories is is something that's just not unique to people who hold um, you know who you know subscribe to and, and search for this information uh, as a way to you know learn things that other people don't know. But it's that desire for trying to make sense in a very uncertain and scary world. Yeah, and that and that process of then hunting for information that seems to start to tell a story, compounded by that um, you know um, information that's available in the world. It's not just information that's now sitting out there waiting for us to hunt it in confirmation bias. Rather, that confirmation bias is served up to us through algorithms, through cookies that predictively place those, you know, uh, apples in our basket. And yeah. so, the, or cherries in our basket. So that, that cherry picking isn't now this kind of either, um, you know, willing suspension of, of disbelief and skepticism, but rather it, it's kind of a dangerous two-way street, but all underpinned by this desire to try to make sense of a very complicated world. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's, again, looking to the universals helps explain a lot and that that universal desire to make sense of bad things that are happening um is is there and it's a good thing in general but i think you're exactly right to point to some of the ways in which we acquire information you know not to call out 
specifics. We all know what's going on with the internet, but but it is problematic that if I click on one conspiracy video on YouTube, that I'm then offered up a bunch of other ones. And it can really feel like, you know, scientists talk about the event horizon of the universe, like we can't see past a certain point, right? Because the light hasn't gotten to us yet. There is this weird kind of event horizon for information sometimes where I, where I think that, um, we call it living in a bubble, but I, that makes it sound as if we are protecting ourselves or we're going out of our way to only listen to certain information. And I think that's probably not the case. I think that um, you get served up enough information that's consistent with your views and you think that you're getting a lot of information, right? If there are 18 videos telling me that this thing is right, and I've only seen one video saying that it's wrong. How, uh, how are we, you know, psychologically, that's a rational process. It's a rational process that can lead us astray in when we tweak the conditions of the environment. And, the, you know, that's what's happening, right? This is, um, I go to talk to people I know, people who think the way I do, people um, who I trust, and getting information from them is not an unreasonable thing to do. How do you snap somebody out of that? That's, that's hard to do. And I, I know one thing, it's not by yelling at them that they're wrong, right? This, this is only serves um, to, to make them feel that they must be right. Or just to pick up on your earlier point, it's also not yelling at people and calling them stupid. Yeah, right, right. That, that there might be smart people who genuinely disagree with you is, is something <laughs> that's difficult for a lot of people to handle. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think one of the most important things that I try to communicate, not explicitly to my students, but through the way that I engage with them is that there is plenty of room for disagreement among reasonable people. And um, it's a challenge because even say I work at a university and I have my own research lab and we talk about things that we all think about all the time and it's very very easy to get caught up in thinking the same um, but the other day I had a lab meeting where it was a lot of arguing there's a lot so much so that some of the newer members of our lab were a bit worried that that they had offended some of the other people and I made it a point to say nobody was offended this is how lab should be we should show people what it's like to respectfully disagree because I think that's the only real way to get out of this, some of the problems that we're in right now. So I guess that just brings us back to um, what's, what's missing from the way people are thinking and the way that people are uh, challenging their, their knowledge and the ways that we're challenging each other. So. Um, if, if Piaget thinks that ultimately some of these things are universally true about our developmental cycle, um, our education system seems to have been remiss in providing some of those, you know, key attributes of what being a scientific thinker um, ought to look like. What are some of the ones um, that you think are important? So we've talked about skepticism so far. Yeah. Um there is this, there's an importance to what I don't have a better word for than humility, but hum, humility often has for some people negative connotations, but it is an attitude of sort of like what I was saying earlier about when my, when my grandfather told me that he didn't know something. Um, there is a sort of humility that it doesn't often get shared in the way that we, um, communicate science. So you have people like, you know, uh, Richard Dawkins or Neil deGrasse Tyson or, you know, um, Carl Sagan even. What they're communicating usually is certainty. They're speaking with authority and expertise. And it can sometimes come across as arrogance because um, when somebody has expertise in some domain, you know, they speak with authority and they believe what they say. What you don't often see is how the sausage is made, right? How often it's important for scientists to realize that they go wrong about something in order to acquire that knowledge. 
and that I think is an attitude. This is that that needs to be taught and fostered. We have to be willing to open up ourselves to the possibility that we're not just wrong, but deeply wrong about some things. Um, I'm a bit of a pessimist when it comes to changing the world in this way, because I think that what it requires is a lot more than we seem capable of doing right now. It would require, I think, a large, large effort on the part of our educational system, which in many cases is just struggling to teach the most basics. Um, because I think you, these kinds of things, the skepticism and the humility is something that is best taught by the example of others. And you need to be exposed to other respectable, authoritative people expressing that they were wrong, right? Um, so I don't know. Uh, you know, I sometimes get depressed at the thought that that we're just all going to go on believing we're right and yelling at each other until uh, <laughs> until we all go down in flames. And it's not just regular yelling, <laughs> you know, yeah. in terms of like healthy debate. It's actually just vicious ad hominem attacks that don't actually advance one's, you know, help me understand either the assumptions that you're relying on to put that fact forward or evidence that you've seen or experience that you have or articulate maybe that intuition that you have a little bit better so I can sink my teeth into it with you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, I, one of the things I like to ask my students sometimes is when's the last time you changed your mind about something important to you. I think that um, when we reflect on this, hopefully it gives us a little sense of how rare it is. Um, and at least in my experience, maybe I'll ask you, Kelly, when's the last time you changed your mind about something that was important? Um, well, I think so much of my time right now is trying to figure out um, what's true and what's not true around COVID-19. And I'm finding it, um, I'm finding it very difficult to, to keep up. And um, when it's, it's such a fascinating process because it's like when you think you understand something and you've got a, a hold on it, then, then those facts right? They have yeah. such, a, such a short half-life right now. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm feeling very much in a position of, uh, I don't even know what I'm, I'm standing on firmly enough to have, have said is a, is, a, is a strong conviction. But there's, but there's definitely lots of things that, um, and I think I'm, I'm like having heard that question a few years ago, um, and, you know, also learning about a statistical technique, you know, of Bayesian modeling, which is, which is just such a cool way to um, look at how we process new information, has at least made me more aware of, of that. So probably, um, you know, I've, I've changed my mind on the fact that I actually changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, you know, COVID is, a, is uh, it's on unfortunately, a very good example, because part of the difficulty in acquiring beliefs rationally is knowing what it means to accept something to be true with some degree of probability. So what I mean, well, I mean, what does it mean? I think the most palpable way for me to explain it is what does it mean when there is a 70% chance of rain? Well, Luckily, that's an easy one. If you're of a certain personality type, you're just going to carry an umbrella. You might carry an umbrella if there's 10% chance of rain. Um, we have to convert probabilistic information, uh, uncertainty, degree of uncertainty, into an actionable item. So I don't know whether masks are effective. Should I wear one? Well, I'm you know 63% sure that if everyone wears one, it'll be a good thing. Does that mean that you carry one? If it dips below that certainty level, does it mean you don't? Um, there are all kinds of pretty complex decisions that we have to make when what we're hardwired, I hate to use the term hardwired, but what, what in fact our biology really is good at is driving behavior, right? All of this stuff is a way to navigate our environment and keep us safe. Like all our nervous system is processing information that's going to 
guide our behavior. And it wasn't built to rationally acquire beliefs in this very fine grained manner. It was built to tell you, should I walk down that path or not? Um, should I eat that thing or not? And those two don't, don't go well together, right? It takes a lot of thinking and undoing our natural ways of thinking. So the other day I read um, an article on COVID that was, I don't remember who wrote it. I don't remember what the publication was. All I remember is the headline was uh, things we still don't know about COVID. And the feeling that I had when I read it was oddly a feeling of relief because for an expert, whoever wrote this to tell me that in fact, there is a lot of uncertainty in the scientific community, that it's not uncertainty that's political uncertainty. It's literally uncertainty about, well, we don't know whether it's transmitted through droplets or you know through air. We, we don't know that yet. It felt we, oddly liberating to know that, hey, you know what? Uh, what we should be doing is trying to get more information, not fighting over who's right. Because the best minds in the world probably have a large degree of uncertainty about a lot of these things. But again, it gets back to communication. If you're a scientist and you're an expert and you think that, say, telling people that wearing masks is going to be the best decision of the two you have, you have to communicate that with some degree of certainty. And what's lost is the possibility that um, that that degree of certainty is something like 60%, right? Um, we have to kind of convert things into actionable chunks of information that are binary, yes or no. And in that, a lot is lost. And in that, you start getting a lot of arguments. Yes. So that, um, that idea that knowledge is, is provisional and constantly changing itself. And, it, and in addition to that, we need to be willing to be flexible, adaptive, and updating to that information makes science a very unappealing way of thinking about the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it, it, it can be depressing. You know, Kelly, I know you personally well enough to know that you've been reading a lot of philosophy of science. And um, I sometimes tell my students to, <laughs> that people who read philosophy of science make for bad scientists because scientists also have to just decide what they're going to believe um, and, and publish a paper you know, arguing for that thing. When you start getting to the fundamental problems with knowledge and how we should go about forming beliefs, then it seems so desperately frustrating that it can, it, it can, it can seem like it's not a good, science isn't a good use of our time. But to that, I just say, look, whether it's magical or not, we seem to have a reliable way of learning information about the world. The fact that we learn this with these sort of Bayesian updating processes or that we you know, hold some beliefs with a level of certainty or not is fine. What we, what we care about is that we're making progress. Every scientific theory is provisional. There's no good scientist in the world that will tell you that they've got the conclusion, right? Everything is a matter of what is the best way to account for these data. And that actually excites me, you know? <laughs> I don't, maybe, maybe I'm weird, but maybe there's a difference between knowing that you can never know for sure versus being pessimistic that we're getting closer. You know, we can be like Zeno's paradox and never get there but we're getting closer, right? We have things and knowledge and technology that we've never had before because of the scientific method. So um, how do you think that science has been, in particular behavioral science, has been doing in terms of its contribution to COVID-19? Are we doing enough? Are we doing the right things? Um, have we been doing some of the wrong things? I have some real opinions <laughs> on this. <laughs> um, and first, let me say, I, as a behavioral scientist myself, somebody trained in it, you know, we're privy to all the, the uh, ugly 
um, errors that that we make. Right? We sort of know um, we sort of know that the process can be fraught with error. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't believe again that we're making progress and that we're doing we're doing good now how we respond to this crisis is is something that i'm a little worried about because a lot of behavioral scientists have jumped on giving advice giving advice quickly and immediately and and this is well intentioned because look it seems like you know like i study disgust and and a lot of that is stuff about disease and disease avoidance. Um, it seems as if I ought to have something really interesting and important to say about this pandemic. But I think that we've jumped the gun as as a field, and this is obviously not everybody. But I think that the quickness with which we've sought to give advice based on what we know might have been a mistake. And I think that it might have been a mistake because um, there is a whole lot of speculation on how to apply some of the things we know. Even if we believe that we know those things 100%, it's unclear whether uh, we should apply them in this specific context. So behavioral science, like with most sciences, is extremely messy. What we're trying to do usually is trying to isolate variables. We're trying to narrow the question down and present it in a way that we can come up with a particular answer about how, say, the mind works or why humans behave the way they do. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're very good at predicting human behavior, right? So just like this is an analogy a million people have used and I know you and I have talked about it but just like a physicist would be terrible at predicting the outcome of a baseball game it's not because physics is wrong and I'm not saying behavioral science is physics but it is it's a usually a different goal so when we study for instance judgment and decision making we're often trying to uh, use very very specific kinds of judgments and decisions in order to basically tap into how the mind works. We're, we're using re really, really specific constrained kinds of questions to figure out how people make judgments. When people make judgments in the real world, though, they're, you know, like probably literally at least 100 things that are affecting them at any given moment. As a behavioral scientist, I think we should investigate all 100 of those. How that plays out in the real world this is, you know, I was recently on a podcast with a couple of friends who are all, both behavioral scientists as well. And I, I said, let's be honest as behavioral scientists. Could we have predicted what's going on right now? The behavior and the beliefs that people are holding right now. Other than knowing that people are partisan, right, which doesn't take behavioral science. It's very hard for me to believe that our expertise would allow us to predict this outcome. So, so I think we could have jumped the gun by giving people, basing our advice on behavioral science evidence that was never meant to predict behavior in the real world. Um, a lot of good people disagree with me, by the way, but this is, <laughs> this is sort of the way that I've seen this play out. Um, that doesn't mean that we ought not use behavioral science. I think this is a great instance in which the scientific method ought to be applied to figure out how people are responding to this pandemic, right? Um, another thing that, that we've at BE Works and you and I have talked about quite a bit is that the only good way to know whether something is true or not is to try to verify it with empirical methods, unless you're talking about logical truths. Um, and if we want to know how, say, people will respond to a message to wear a mask, we should study how people are responding to the message of wearing a mask. Now, that can be informed by all kinds of studies we've done in the past, um, but we won't really know about this problem until we study this problem. That's where I think behavioral science plays ought to play a huge role, because studying how people are behaving right now will allow us to one, know whether interventions are working or not, which is I think critical to, to getting this thing under control. Um, 
And two, it will help us understand perhaps only this situation, but it will help us understand how the mind works, at least under these conditions, which is, I think, a worthy task. Um, it's just hard to, to know what to make of research on message framing that was done with one set of problems and bring it here to the COVID problem. There's so much going on. So we've, we've had many conversations about the differences between research that's been done in the lab and research that's done in the real world. And BE Works was born, um, you know, pretty much primarily to um, overcome that, that gap um, and to improve the nature of what we know about, about research, about human behavior, because it's a much more complex and, and dynamic world. And to be able to find things out through that real world um, can just add to such um, richness to, to, the, to the knowledge that we have. But um, just to play back what you said, um, you know, one of the things that um, concerns you is the jump to advice. And um, you know, you're saying that because what, what we've tested in the lab is very basic, it's very controlled, um, and you know, context matters. And so we're not in a position in, in a new and evolving science to say, hey, even if it's strong in the lab, it's still a lab, it's not the real world. These are new behaviors, very complex and dynamic environment. We can't jump to advice. Okay, okay. Um, so, so then you talked about um, the need for empirical evidence, basically the need for experiments. Yeah. So let's get practical here. Yeah. Limited time, limited budget, so many unknowns. How would we run experiments? Yeah, so this is getting into the weeds, but getting into the weeds in exactly the way that I think is important not only for what we do at BE Works, but for behavioral scientists at large. And I think that, um, you know, there's obvious things like we prioritize and budget and, and use budget to, to collect data. I think one of the most important things that we should have is an infrastructure that allows us to continue collecting data and by that, I don't mean creepy Facebook knowing what you want to buy data. I mean things like um, taking regular measures of how people are responding in your county, in your city, in your state uh, to see, right? It's very sometimes very hard to do a true experiment where we're randomly assigning people to, to one condition versus another. But um, what we call pseudo experiments are very possible where you get a city that instituted a lockdown and one that didn't that are matched very similarly and you try to see what the outcomes are right now we're suffering from a lack of even acquiring data right so the data looks really really different if you assume that we don't have accurate reporting and it's not in many cases not because people are hiding the numbers it's that we didn't have the infrastructure really to collect these data so i think that one of the things this for, for governments, but also for, for you know, uh, private institutions, companies, make it so that you can actually take a look at your own data and see what's happening. So I think so often it's too little too late where we think, right, if we're trying to get start right now from scratch to collect field data on COVID, it's hard. Right? We need a lot of money, we need time, we need funds, and things are moving faster than we can often uh, respond to in the field. It would be nice if we had a constant trail of data that we could reliably trust, that everybody would agree is, is something that would be important for any future problem. Right? Um, so that's not quite a solution, because what I'm saying is well, we, sh <laughs> we should have done this 10 years ago maybe, um, but in the future, I think it should be a, it ought to be a priority for any, any um, I think, government to at least collect these data regularly so they can see what's going on. So what I'm hearing is the mantra of a data scientist at, at a minimum. And in behavioral science, I think a behavioral scientist um, has a, 
has a need uh, very much for powerful data science. In absence of data science, it's very difficult to do behavioral science other than just guessing at things and hoping that it works. That foundation of data science is reliant on data. And so without that underpinning of high quality data, then it's very difficult. And we might have more than enough. Um, it's not a randomized control test. It doesn't fit those standards of, of the sort of highest caliber of evidence, but at least we might be in a better position if we have the data where we can start to make reasonable inferences from that data. Yeah, I think you point to something important, which I sort of didn't finish the thought, which was that infrastructure of constantly collecting data then allows behavioral scientists who are more interested in experimental or, or quasi-experimental designs to do things like initiate, say, in their city, a large-scale field study um, and have the ability to collect the data in a way that does, you know, doesn't require all of a sudden the, the building of, of infrastructure. So Kelly, you uh, and I and BE Works were involved, have been involved in many of these kinds of data collections, but we were looking at the behavior of uh, people who ride buses in a, in a major city and whether or not they are paying their fare, right? This was a big problem with people not paying their fare. Um, I would not have been able to predict that the primary problem going into this would be getting good data from, uh, say, bus companies, right, or the city about who was paying and who wasn't paying. Because we go in this, we're like, well, it's going to take some time to um, decide how to use different messages to see if people pay more fare than others. Um, but that part turns out to be not that difficult. Right, you can just randomly pick some buses, and of course there are all kinds of, of technicalities, but just to get good data before and after a manipulation requires people out there with little clickers collecting, looking, and reliably over time collecting information. So the ability to quickly deploy that sort of thing right now would give us a lot of contact information, for instance, about people um, who they've been with, who they've been talking to, um, right? Again, there are ways to do it. I think both you and I are very sensitive to privacy concerns here, but there has to be a good way of quickly gathering data for important outcomes. Yeah, you've reminded me of um, when we were talking about the difference between uh, jumping to advice versus having, you know, robust experiments to support, you know, what should be scaled out afterwards. Um, one of the reasons from, from my observation that we had mixed messages around masks um, and their utility for everyday citizens was that prior research on masks had analyzed um, one side of the equation, which was how uh, different kinds of masks uh, served, like especially like the fabric and kind of the homemade do-it-yourself level mask versus the N95s and the N99s, how effective they are at preventing infection. When it turns out that one of the things that we need in the real world is actually the other side of that equation, which is um, helping stop the spread of infection. All of that original research that's been done to date on masks have had focused on, on um, limiting the amount of droplets that could be inhaled versus the role that it plays in, in stopping that spread. That is what uh, has been pointed to as, as one of the, yeah. the things that led our public health leaders to, it seemed to, um, first of all, not advocate, then equivocate, and then ultimately, um, I think that realization hit, it's like, oh, wait a second, we're we're only looking at one side of the of the equation that the prior research had been based on. Yeah, it's a great example. And you could ask questions, so, so what ought we have done in that case? And here's where I think it's not a behavioral science problem. This is a problem of just um, relying on governments and institutions to make the best choice with the available information. And it may be that in this case, the best choice would be taking doing a cost benefit analysis of what you know what are the chances that everybody wearing masks is going to cut things down um, uh, versus not 
given what we know and have somebody strong enough to just do it um, is is not that's not a behavioral science problem. I mean, it is for the leaders, perhaps um, uh, why we have leaders who don't do that. But this is but easier said than done. Right. But sometimes decisions have to be made. Imagine this. You're, you're right to point out this is a problem with a lot of of uh, wanting to be right before we act. Imagine if if this was a large scale problem where we did not know whether to tell people uh, whether to take an umbrella or whether a hurricane was going to hit. Right? Uh, we don't know. There's a probability that a hurricane is going to hit. Um, what at what probability do you say clear the town? Right? I grew up in in Florida, as did you. <laughs> Hurricane David, I believe, was was around when I was a kid. There has to be a judgment call that says, what are going to be the costs associated with making this decision? And I think importantly, what if I make the wrong decision? There is a cost associated with saving face and there's a cost associated with lives lost. And like, it's not always an easy call, but I think that, that in, in many times it would be easier to apologize for the cost because you thought lives would be saved, then it would be to, you know, deal with 100,000 deaths. Um, now, this is all hindsight bias, right? This is, this is not something that I think I could have done um, in advance. But I think that the, the analysis that, that you're making me think of right now is, yeah, maybe, maybe we're too wishy-washy. Maybe it's, we're, we have these two sides, right? Don't be too arrogant. Um, Right. Uh, but express confidence. And it's like, well, if I'm already worried about people looking at YouTube conspiracy videos, how are they going to get the subtlety of that? Right. How are they going to say, um, well, look, I don't know if you wearing a mask is going to do anything, but we should all do it. Right. We, we know Americans. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the other day I was listening to a, a podcast that a, a friend of mine was on and he's, a, he's actually um, a formerly a, a, a physicist and, and now he plays a, a role in, in public policy. And uh, he talked about how one of the things that um, he's, he's seeing is that in his role in, in government is that we're actually getting better at doing little experiments not big ones, not necessarily meaningful ones, but we're starting to um, you know, evolve uh, the role of little experiments in uh, public policy and government and, and in business. We've certainly seen tons of little experiments. You know, Google does millions of little experiments. Facebook does millions of little experiments. And they do that to understand their customers and help, help with uh, you know, advertising and, and you know, drive eyeballs and, and these kinds of metrics. And now we're starting to, to see that in, in business. This, this was some of the stuff that's been the most fun work that we've ever had is working in the face of very, very complex dynamics businesses, you know, as, as much of these projects have been fun, they're, they're still with, they're not unlimited budgets. It's definitely not unlimited time. So those realities still constrain us. Um, what is missing that behavioral science ought to be bringing to the table in addition to the, the, the highly qualified, highly provisional playbook on human behavior as best we know it to date is a playbook on little experiments, little experiments around messaging, little experiments on the recommendations that we make to support epidemiologists who say, our model looks like X if, if people do this, and it looks like Y if they, if they don't do that. And that there's little experiments that, um, that I think that we need to make that playbook much easier. And there's still work to be done. Um, the, the pandemic is still upon us. It's, it's not been declared gone. There's no line of sight exactly on, on when uh, hopefully we, we will reach that point where our, our global health leaders and who will say, you know, the pandemic has you know, been declassified. 
Um, so we still have room in things like contact tracing, which is like a digital app. And if I'm if I'm hearing you and you know inspired by some of your comments around collecting data, so instead of just asking people where they've been or who they've been in contact with, um, questions ought to be bolted onto that. Maybe have you been wearing a mask? Yeah, you know what you're saying makes me think of bringing this back around to where we started in this conversation, which is um, we are already naturally inclined to make causal hypotheses about the world, right? That's just part of how the human mind works. So what we're doing now often turns into a, well, what did um, South Korea do that worked? What did, you know, Singapore do that worked? And we're constructing these post hoc causal models where we say, well, what they did was they caught it a week earlier than we did, or what they did was they drastically limited things with their laws. Um, we don't know, right? We don't know. Like it could have been 18 things. It could have been one real important thing. Um, and sure, we can go and analyze those things after the fact and try to figure out how it worked. But what you're pointing to is it would also be very beneficial to be able to rapidly deploy field experiments to see if at least we could come up with little models that are consistent with the bigger models. Um, and in the absence of that information, we're just making judgment calls. And it's fine to make a judgment call. Like I was saying before, you know, our weather is uncertain and we're making judgment calls all the time about weather. Um, but in something as important, as this, wouldn't it be nice to have had all the resources that that uh, you know the, that we have to track the weather? Um, wouldn't it have been nice to get those data um, to have models that are giving us information about the spread of the flu five years ago, the spread of SARS, whatever ten years ago it was, um, and see if the early models coincide with that here, and then do field experiments where we, you know, city by city, maybe randomly assign people to get certain messages or not, or look at cities that have stricter mask laws. Like it's, it's all, it's all trying. It's a, it's a method to try to acquire information about the world that is reliable and that will help us make decisions. It doesn't have to be, you know, according to Hoyle true in, in the hundred percent criteria range that we might want for the facts, facts, but nothing works that way, right? Nothing, nothing does. There is the only, the only downside to acquiring, you know, this is something that, that you and I have seen over and over again. One of the biggest downsides to doing experiments and acquiring information, collecting data is that you might realize you were wrong and nobody wants to be the stakeholder who made the wrong decision. So oftentimes there's this weird disincentive to do the proper kind of data collection or the proper kind of experiment to show that, that you might be wrong. And if we're not willing to show that we might be wrong sometimes, um, and because of that, we, we prevent uh, the proper collection of data or the proper methods um, of experimentation, then we're more screwed than ever, right? <laughs> I mean, we need money, we need resources, we need time. But again, this is prioritizing. So much of the pandemic from its root cause to um, hopefully its eventual dis diminishment in society um, is all fundamentally about behavior. And there's an opportunity for behavioral science to develop a much stronger partnership with um, our epidemiologist, um, our uh, folks who study zoonotic diseases, because now we've all come to understand that uh, these dangerous pathogens are very much a consequence of human behavior. And one of the ways um, in terms of non-pharmacological interventions for us to fight back with these, against these pathogens is to fundamentally change our behavior. So maybe behavioral science hasn't done nearly enough. Maybe, maybe we did okay with the hand washing thing, uh, but maybe we have, uh, there's many other things that we can do and can improve upon and the work is still ahead of us. So as we hopefully get our public health leaders um, better funding, 
um, better regulatory support as we hope that our epidemiologists and the disaster teams that, that support them, um, you know, ho hopefully we have a chance when hopefully a vaccine uh, uh, takes care of this problem for us that we need to strengthen our interdisciplinary partnership um, to, yeah. yeah, that point right there is where, where I saw you going and, and I completely 100% agree. I think a lot of the problems that, that the early behavioral science that I was sort of saying might have led us astray, I think was a result of perhaps not working with the right people who can give us information about, say, how the disease works, everything we know about how the disease works. Um, and, and it really does require an interdisciplinary effort. This is this is a problem of behavior. It's a problem of biology. It's a problem of uh, political structure. You know, it's it's all of those things, and we really need to be able to. Again, maybe this is a case of humbling ourselves and saying, uh, "What can I learn from my colleagues in another discipline that can help me solve this problem?" Because if I go at it alone. You know, how does a behavioral scientist know what behavior to encourage without knowing from the epidemiologists and and the the you know medical researchers how this virus works, right? Um, but yeah, what once we have a clear view of a problem, then I think behavioral science can kick in with a lot. You know, we've been trained to think about how humans work, even if previous work on you know some specific message framing problem doesn't apply. We have a whole uh, body of work on judgment under uncertainty. And, you know, a big problem on, in this pandemic was that people are walking around not knowing if they have it. How do people deal with that? We can get some good ideas from that. We can design experiments. and But, but we also need to know. We needed to know that that's how the virus worked before we did that. Again, this is all very easy for me to say from my armchair. <laughs> 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 if only people had listened to me in the past. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that this is probably um, as good a point as, as any to uh, end our discussion. Um, I think that there's just so many more things that we can continue to, to talk about. But I hope that people uh, enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. It's always wonderful talking to you about science. Likewise. And what people don't know is that we've had uh, various conversations in the past where we yelled at each other a lot more about science. Uh, we were being very civilized here. We're very civilized. That's why we're going to up so we can get to yelling at each other. <laughs> well, th thank you for having me. It was, it was wonderful. My pleasure.